The Italian Renaissance would probably have begun 100 years earlier if not for a series of disasters that struck Europe in the mid-14th century. In the 1340s, wars and financial collapses weakened the economy of two of Italy's most prosperous cities, Florence and Siena. In 1346 and 1347, crop failures brought about widespread famine. Then in 1348, the final blow was struck. The bubonic plague arrived with great intensity killing 50 to 75 percent of Europe's population in one summer, including many of the most innovative artists. Those who escaped death turned away from the modern pre-Renaissance style created by such artists as Giotto and revived the older, more traditional medieval style with its strong Christian message. The hiatus only lasted about 50 years. By the year 1400, the art scene in Italy began to change once again. Politically and economically, it was still a period of chaos, but the turmoil of the times helped create an atmosphere of artistic experimentation. In the early 1400s, the world woke up. From its beginnings in Florence, Italy, this renaissance, or French for rebirth, of culture spread to Rome and Venice, then in 1500 to the rest of Europe, known as the Northern Renaissance, the Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, and England. Common elements were the rediscovery of art and literature of Greece and Rome, the scientific study of the body and the natural world, and the intent to reproduce the forms of nature realistically. Aided by new technical knowledge, like the study of anatomy, artists achieved new heights in portraiture, landscape, mythological, and religious paintings. As skills increased, the prestige of the artist soared, reaching its peak during the High Renaissance, with megastars like Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. During the Renaissance, such things as the exploration of new continents and scientific research boosted man's belief in himself, while, at the same time, the Protestant Reformation decreased the sway of the Church. As a result, the study of God, the Supreme Being, was replaced by the study of the human being. From the minutely detailed realistic portraits of Jan van Eyck to the emotional intensity of Derer's woodcuts and engravings to the contorted bodies and surrealism of Hieronymus Bosch, art was the means to explore all facets of life on Earth. During the Renaissance, technical innovations and creative discoveries made possible new styles of representing reality. The major breakthroughs were the change from tempera paint on wood panels and fresco on plaster walls to oil on stretch canvas and the use of perspective, giving weight and depth to form, the use of light and shadow as opposed to simply drawing lines, and pyramidal composition in paintings. Oil on canvas. Oil on canvas became the medium of choice during the Renaissance. With this method, a mineral like lapis lazuli was usually ground fine, then mixed with turpentine and oil to be applied as oil paint. A greater range of rich colors with smooth gradations of tone permitted painters to represent textures and simulate three-dimensional form. Perspective. One of the most significant discoveries in the history of art was the method for creating the illusion of depth on a flat surface called perspective, which became a foundation of European painting for the next 500 years. Linear perspective created the optical effect of objects receding in the distance through lines that appeared to converge at a single point in the picture known as the vanishing point. In Masaccio's The Tribute Money, lines converged behind the head of Christ. Painters also reduced the size of objects and muted colors or blurred details as objects got farther away. The use of light and shadow. Chiaroscuro, which means light and dark in Italian, referred to the new technique for modeling forms and painting by which lighter parts seemed to emerge from the dark areas, producing the illusion of rounded sculptural relief on a flat surface. Pyramid configuration. Rigid profile portraits and grouping of figures on a horizontal grid in the picture's foreground gave way to a more three-dimensional pyramid configuration. This symmetrical composition builds to a climax at the center 
as in Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, where the focal point is the figure's head. The Early Renaissance. The Renaissance was born in Florence. The three geniuses who invented this new style included the painter Masaccio and the sculptor Donatello, who reintroduced naturalism to art, and the painter Botticelli, whose elegant linear figures reached a height of refinement. The founder of early Renaissance painting, which became the cornerstone of European painting for more than 600 years, was Masaccio. Nicknamed Sloppy Tom because he neglected his appearance in pursuit of his art, Masaccio was the first since Giotto to paint the human figure not as a linear column in the Gothic style, but as a real human being. As a Renaissance painter, Masaccio made his figures stand up upon their feet. Other Masaccio innovations were a mastery of perspective and his use of a single constant source of light casting accurate shadows. It was Masaccio who really kick-started painting by generating so much excitement with his use of perspective. Another amazing fact is Masaccio produced all his works by the age of 27, which was also the year he died. As we can see in Tribute Money, Masaccio expands upon Giotto's bold figures by relaxing their stances. Notice how all the figures are standing in the classical contrapposto stance and creating believable modeling. But what is truly revolutionary is Masaccio's correct use of one-point perspective. The lines going back in space converge on a single vanishing point, which just happens to be Christ's head. Notice how the lines illustrated here force the eye to Christ's head. Even one of the mountain slopes angles to the vanishing point. Tribute Money also has a running narrative common to earlier works. It's like three paintings in one. In the center portion, Jesus and the apostles are confronted by a tax collector. He's the man in the short tunic with his back to us. Jesus tells Peter to take a coin out of the mouth of a fish to pay the taxes, which we see him doing in the left part of this painting. And finally on the right, Peter is paying the tax collector. What is really Renaissance, however, is Masaccio's sparse landscape that fades away as it goes back into space. This technique is called atmospheric perspective. You'll see it being used a lot from now on. Masaccio's Holy Trinity shows his amazing ability to use perspective and pyramid configuration to balance this composition in a logical and orderly way. One last thing. The skeleton resting on the coffin has a warning painted in Italian that reads, What you are, I once was. What I am, you will become. Not a very happy outlook. Donatello. What Masaccio did for painting, Donatello did for sculpture. His work recaptured the central discovery of classical sculpture, contrapposto, or weight concentrated on one leg with the rest of the body relaxed, often turned. Donatello carved figures and draped them realistically with a sense of their underlying skeletal structure. His David was the first life-size freestanding nude sculpture since the classical period. This David is cast in bronze. It was probably used as the centerpiece of a fountain because a hole has been drilled in the helmet for water. David is the Old Testament king that as a young boy slew his giant enemy Goliath. We see David done many times, several by Donatello, but the most famous David of the Renaissance is by Michelangelo. Why does this David not have any clothes except for his boots and helmet? It may be a reference to an ancient god of Rome, Mercury, who was also shown with a hat, boots, and nothing else. The brutal naturalism of Mary Magdalene was even more probing, harshly accurate, and more real than even the ancient Roman portraits. He carved the aged Magdalene as a gaunt, shriveled hag with stringy hair and hollow eyes. 
Donatello's sculpture was so lifelike that the artist was said to have shouted at it, Speak, speak, or the plague take you. Botticelli While Donatello and Masaccio laid the groundwork for three-dimensional realism, Botticelli was moving in the opposite direction. His decorative linear style and tiptoeing golden-haired maidens were more a throwback to Byzantine art, yet his nudes epitomized the Renaissance. Birth of Venus marks the rebirth of classical mythology. In Birth of Venus, we see something entirely new to Renaissance painting. First, Botticelli's figures look nothing like anything we've seen so far. They're flattened, airy, in low relief, and almost void of modeling. The canvases are shallow. Depth is not an issue here. In fact, it's almost as if everything we've learned about Renaissance painting has been totally disregarded. Second, the use of pagan mythology is blatant. So what's up with Botticelli? The answer is rather complex. First, Botticelli painted this work for Lorenzo de' Medici's country villa just outside of Florence, so it wasn't intended for public view. The painting acts as an allegory for rebirth, just as Venus, the symbol of heavenly beauty, emerged from the depths of the sea. Florence emerged from the medieval brine to take her place as the shining epitome of Renaissance grandeur. So Venus isn't really Venus. She's actually Florence. Therefore, the painting isn't really pagan, is it? Actually, this type of reasoning saved the painting from being burned by early Christian conservatives in the late 1400s. It's even survived a slashing by some madmen in the early 1970s, not to mention a television commercial by Martha Stewart a couple of years ago. So our Venus must be doing something right. Botticelli's justification for using pagan imagery is even more complicated in the work entitled Primavera, meaning spring, also commissioned for Lorenzo's country estate. This painting, based on a poem about the birth of love in spring, shows Venus in the center of the work, almost as if she were the Virgin Mary, with Cupid floating up above. One interpretation of this painting is that the work symbolizes the different forms love can take, platonic love in the form of the three graces to the left of Venus, subductive love in the form of Flora, the goddess of heavenly beauty and passion, godly love, as symbolized by Mercury to the far left as he points to the heavens and immoral love, actually lust would be a better word, symbolized by Zephyr whom forcefully abducts a young maiden for his own pleasures. So here Venus stands in the middle, almost in a last judgment, with the good guys of love on the left and the bad guys of love on the right. What Botticelli has done is to merge classical mythology with quasi-Christian values. 